uh, that mitzvahs automatically create resistance. And they create resistance because there would be no point in commanding something if people did it naturally. Uh, so there's no mitzvah to breathe. There's no mitzvah to sleep. You'll do it anyway. So mitzvahs imply resistance. But mitzvahs don't contain the teaching to overcome resistance. That's something that one has to derive from so many passages, uh, A, in interpreting the narratives from the Torah, from the prophets, Psalms, Proverbs, the idea of how to fight resistance is all over our tradition, but especially in the, uh, the Talmudic tradition, when in the conceiving of the Yetzirah, taking a biblical passage and turning, and turning it into a profound psychological force. Put it in terms of our Torah portion, the commandment to build the Mishkan, to build a Mishkan, and God says, that, and I will dwell among them. Uh, as you know, whenever I hear these beautiful phrases, ever since I was a young person, I would ask, what exactly does that mean? I love it, it sounds great. Tell me exactly what you mean by building an inner Mishkan. And that's, I think, part of what, about my growth as a human being, that I had to translate metaphors into spiritual psychological practices. Because if I couldn't translate it into a spiritual psychological practice, it just remained at the metaphoric level. Meaning it's a great symbol, but what exactly do we do now? So I want to put that in context of the, you know, one of the, what I call the, the basic classes that I teach in my Wisdom Works curriculum. Uh, the first is virtue, wall of virtue, you know, be able to regulate and contain with other people. Uh, the dimension of uh, rationality, uh, to be able to think about yourself and other person uh, in, number one, factually uh, correct ways, and also to build good theories about yourself and other people. Uh, sometimes people say to me, I don't understand why my wife, husband, partner, parent, child does this, and you know my classic response is, uh, give it a try. They say, what do you mean give it a try? I said, you don't understand, give it a try. You know them for a long time. You know them for 20 years. You must have a theory about why they do and what they don't do. So that idea is, I don't understand, is actually the Yetzirah. Yes because when you say, I don't understand, you are discharged from any further thinking. But what if your Yetzirah yes says, I don't understand this person, and your higher self says, give it a try? What's your theory? So I have found it very important from a spiritual psychological perspective that we actually create theories that are testable. It's kind of a science of the soul. Theory about myself, about other people, about the human condition. Construct a theory, test it, come back and write another theory. Now, creating good theories is a wonderful treatment of one of the most common things I see, which is people having chronic confusion. They're not able to complete thoughts. Thoughts don't co cohere with the other. Uh, a lot of disorganized thinking, which is why you know I insist so much in the, on the rationality practice of the police report. People can't even tell me what happened because the feelings are so disorganized by their passions. I'm sorry, their thought is so disorganized by their passions. So this idea of virtue then rationality, I. It doesn't sound like a spiritual discipline. It's a profound spiritual discipline because of how much suffering is created because we don't think well about ourselves and other people. Of course, the, the third basic class, the one I'm teaching now, called Managing Ego States, I want to get to. And then the fourth one is the Processing Well with Others. So to the class that I'm doing right now, Managing Ego States is essential to building the inner Mishkan. If the inner Mishkan most deeply means a place where whatever we call the divine can dwell. If that's what it means, we ask, have to ask ourselves, what drives out the divine? If it were simple for the divine to dwell within us, we wouldn't be here. We wouldn't be trying to understand and teach these things and listen to beautiful poetry and divrei Torah. Uh, for us to create ourselves, to be a proper receptacle of the divine takes enormous discipline, and work. It's a high-sounding phrase. I love the phrase, but it requires assiduous will and skill. And from my perspective, what I call managing the inner life, 
That's the skill of making the inner life hospitable to the divine. Now, I want to borrow a phrase from Aristotle that I've been teaching on Tuesday nights. I've been rereading uh, Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics, impressed and blown away all over again at his brilliance, and also reminding myself why I felt when I studied the book in college, it was lacking. But here's one thing beautiful. You know, Aristotle is like geometrically trying to trying to build build the uh, the inner life, build the world, build metaphysics, um, build language. I mean, it's just an astonishing project of taking everything, including human consciousness, and expanding it in some kind of mathematical uh, uh, scheme. So he has the following question: um, Let's take a uh, uh, you know a, 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 a human being. So I'll say. Uh, Who's out there? Mel. You're going to be my, the magician's assistant tonight. Let's take Mel. All right, so what is, what is an individual? Well, you can say, well, we can describe um, height, uh, complexion, race, gender. There are so many things. So when one says a person is this, you know, Mel is this, those are called attributes. Assuming there's a substance. Now, try to imagine that you are a substance with attributes. What's the substance? What is the substance of the human being that is not our attributes, which basically comes down to the physical self? The physical self are attributes, but what's the substance that the physical attributes are built around? I just want you to hold that thought. Try to imagine that you have a substance that your physical self is holding in space, making you something uh, apprehendable, but those, ap- those, your apprehendability is not your substance. Your apprehendability is not your substance, just as the apprehendability of God is not God's substance. That's why when we say, the knowers of the name, meaning the knowers of what's inside the name. Many people say, I don't believe in God because they don't believe in attributes that are taught dogmatically. And I say, attributes that are taught dogmatically are not God. They're just little theological formulas all tidied up and, and uh, you know, I call it, you know, little boxes with nice bows on them. That's not the substance. So one thing I, take, I took from Aristotle, which was very moving to me, is to think of yourself as a substance, not attributes. And when you start to think of yourself as a spiritual substance, a non-physical spiritual substance that has a physical dimension, but that's not your substance, those are your attributes, you're well on the way to discovering, not that Aristotle talked about this, the what I'll call the authentic self or the substantial self. So isn't it odd that when we think of substantial, we think of something with physical substance, but whatever the Greek word is, Aristotle did not mean the physical substance, he meant the spiritual substance. So try to imagine that we all have a spiritual substance that's somehow connected with our souls, is somehow connected with the authentic self, all the words that are connected with your spiritual uh, uh, substance are connected there. Now, the problem is, when we try to think about our spiritual substance and our spiritual substance connecting with the the substance of the cosmic mind, there are spoilers. There are activities of the inner life that want us to forget our substance, that want us to forget, you might call, the primal substance out of which physicality develops. There's a primal substance. When you know it, when you can know your primal substance, your soul, your authentic self, and that's the means of knowing the spiritual substance of the universe, there's no anger. There's no resentment. There's no guilt. There's no shame. No anxiety. There's no fear. There's a moment when all of those things that happen in the unconscious ego self, they're just gone. Because if you align, you've aligned your substance with the divine substance, whatever that means. I'm not trying to preach a theology. I'm not saying believe in the Bible. I'm not saying I know how we ought to apprehend the divine. I'm just saying there's something called the spiritual substance that is not empirical, nor is our substance 
empirical. So try to imagine you can, you can contemplate, you can pierce through consciousness, or you can descend beyond the unconscious ego self, and you could experience your spiritual substance. Sometimes it's the pure light when I go up in my practice, or it's the river from Eden when I go down in my spiritual practice. Oh, there, there are two experiences of the same thing. And then you come back, and you're able to look at your, the activities of the unconscious ego self that make you forget. All the modes or ego states of the unconscious ego self that make you forget because we're so attached to something in the world or so attached to something in ourselves. I'm going to give you, we talk about many things on the Wednesday night class. And by the way, the, the question, I mean, if you were there, you know what I'm talking about. The question and comments of the students and conversation was really remarkable and, uh, and, and very deep. A lot of vulnerability, people just opening up, talking about things. I want to mention one thing I talked about, I'll finish for tonight, and that is something, I don't know if this exists in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, the DSM that, that you know psychologists use to diagnose people, but it's a problem of perseverating. Okay? You can't let go. Okay, you're that, you're that dog with the bone in its mouth. You're the, you're the ferret that can't let go. You, 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 you clenched onto something. And I remember, I still can't track it down, uh, the narrative in Camus where the person suffers a, 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 a slight walking down the stairs, if I remember this at all. If anybody remembers the citation put in the, in the chat. And the, as far as I recall the story, he perseverates. And I talked about just our general experiences. Somebody slights you. Someone devalues you. Someone says something that's, that, uh, that touches a wound in your soul. Something you need, not given, and suddenly it becomes of it becomes something of existential proportions. Now, what they did or didn't do is not proportionate to your feelings. That is a deep part of spiritual psychology. What other people do does not account for the depth of our feelings when we have experienced an injury to our dignity. Now, one way through it, by the way, as I've worked through many things in my life, I just take a breath and then I try to align with me, my spiritual substance with the divine substance. And I just try to put these things out of, out of that connection. But sometimes something happens and we perseverate. We can't let go. And as I looked at myself and counseled countless people in my uh 1981 was my first pulpit, however many years. It keeps changing. Every year, the number changes. So 1981. Um, I've met people who have perseverated. And I, um, I know I have. And what I realized, it's an injury to the soul so deep, it's like, a, it's like a very profound grief that if you let go, it's as if you're saying the injury wasn't that deep. So here, here's a, a thought that I have. Perseverating is a kind of a sacrifice to an idol of your injury. Meaning, if you didn't perseverate, the injury wasn't that bad. So if someone says something and someone says, well, did, I, got, I got slighted today, you know, and I went, you know, uh, some clerk on a power trip, and you, know, sorry, you, you didn't do that. Blah, blah. I said, yeah, okay, sorry, man. I just, and me I said, you handled that really well. I said, what am I going to do, get in an argument with a clerk? It's like... If that's how you got to, what you got to do to go through your day is, um, you know, put down people that are momentarily powerless because the clerk has to move you on to the next thing. I said, it's his day. Let him have his day. A much younger person, I don't know if I would have done anything, but I would have felt hot as I've gotten older. It's just nothing. It's this guy trying to find meaning in his life. He has a little bit of power for about 10 seconds, and he's going to pack all the meaning he can in those 10 seconds. And if I can just submit to you and help you feel powerful, I've done my mitzvah. You know, you're out of your misery for 10 seconds, and I'm going to move on. You're not. So, um, but I think a different version of me would have perseverated. How dare he injure my dignity in this little moment of control? So think about it. When you have perseverated, when you are saying, I can't get over what this person did or didn't do, or I can't get over myself 
what I did or didn't do, the injury is so deep that something in the unconscious ego self says, if we let go, it means it wasn't so deep that we don't have the, the capacity to transcend it. And there's a, real, there's a real demonic dance at play. If I let go, I have to admit, my feelings are disproportionate to reality. That's why people can't let go. Because they have to admit that their feelings are not proportionate to reality. Because once you let go, you say, yeah, my feelings were disproportionate to reality. I, may, I didn't make up what happened, but I certainly made up how I felt about it. And how do I know that? Because I can change how I feel about it as an act of will. I can contact with my vision for myself, marshal up the will, look at this and say to myself, that's not a good place to be. That mode is not healthy for me or anybody else. I can transcend it, which perforce means in the initial position, I created that. So you have a choice to make. You want to let go and admit you made a spiritual mistake, a spiritual emotional mistake, and just say to yourself, my bad. I, I, I did that all by myself. Or hold on, perseverate, which, so, which was self-justifies, but makes everything worse. So um, this, uh, I, I'm thinking about it because, you know, whenever in a, in a given couple of months the, I have a similar counseling sessions, I say, okay, A, I needed to hear it, and B, probably other people need to hear that too. So I just want to offer that to you. As you are building your inner Mishkan, look at the things that involuntarily come up and you say, that's so wrong. Either it was something that I do or they did. You can't let go. And it is not voluntary. You don't sit down and say, let me drum up my late, the latest injury to my sense of self. It's involuntary. You just sit there minding your own business and it shows up and says, oh, but wait a minute, there was an injury to your dignity. Don't, don't forget about that, whatever else you're doing. And it says, yeah, you're right. Injury, injury, perseverate, perseverate. And then you look at yourself and say, I need to stop thinking about this. Ever done that? You say to yourself, I need to stop thinking about that. Ever done that? And it says, no, you don't. We'll see you in two minutes. And you get out of your head, and you're doing this other thing, reading a beautiful poem, and it's back. And you say, I, I thought I told you I don't want you to be here anymore. It says, yeah, I know you told me that, but you're not in charge. I'm in charge. That is where the temple is created. That's where the temple is created, what you can do with involuntary thoughts, feelings, and emotion. So I want to offer that to you. And, uh, you know, the beautiful, as Svatamet would say, in this beautiful Shabbos day where we really have to cultivate connecting our substance to the divine substance, one of the ways of which is to read everything as poetry, look at these alien thoughts and say to ourselves, actually, I'm in charge. I'm in char charge of the ecology of my inner life. And we take our teachings and the inspiration of Shabbos and Torah and we... Uh, uh, we, we manage our lives into a, a better future. All right, everybody, Shabbat Shalom. That's my message for you tonight. And I will continue on um, uh, some insights from my Tuesday and Wednesday classes on how to build the inner Mishkan.